So we had three points of inquiry on the table for your breakout rooms, which you guys should have discussed. Um, the significance of the song, uh, the significance of Otis, Jesse's childhood friend, and what stood out most about Baldwin's writing style. Um, who wants to share what was discussed in the breakout rooms? Uh, one thing that, well, we talked about in our breakout room, uh, like for question three, what stood out most about Baldwin's writing style, we found it to be like extremely vulgar, but not without reason. It was like, he said a lot of like very like vulgar things, but like with the purpose of trying to get a point across, uh, like Jesse's like point of view and his thought process mm -hmm. a lot more specifically. So I found that really interesting. Yeah, you know, um, that's an interesting point, Cleo. I, I never thought about it as vulgar, um, but you're right. You're, you're absolutely not wrong. There's a vulgarity to the way that he writes. Um, also, like a rawness to it, right? He, he's not trying to, yeah. yeah, he's not trying to paint an ugly picture pretty. You know, he's just kind of telling what it like it is. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so, what other things was discussed? How about the role of Otis? What did you guys think about Otis? Uh, for Otis, I kind of said, like, thought about how uh, you know, he used to be close with, like, Jesse, and, like, they would used to, like, they used to play games and stuff, and then, um, and then, like, I was kind of confused because I guess um, something happened with his parents, and he got, um, he did, I guess, like, Otis didn't do anything wrong, but, like, something uh, terrible happened, and I thought that connected with, like, the part later on with the yeah. <clears throat> with the one guy yeah, um, getting tortured. So I thought like there was something significant there, but I, I couldn't piece it together. Like I'm guessing that's his father, but um, yeah, I was kind of like uh, stuck on that one. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely um, clarify that for you, Zachary, when it gets to my notes, okay? Oh, okay, perfect, yeah. But yeah, he was like, uh, he used to be Jesse's friend. Yeah, absolutely. And did anybody talk about the song at all? What, what do you think Baldwin is doing with the song? Because it's almost a character unto itself. Nobody. Okay. So let's do this then. I'll, I'll jump into my notes. And then from there, we'll go into our uh, fishbowl. Um, I do ask that you grab a pencil and paper. Uh, I'm going to provide you with your final um, theoretical framework for the semester. That will give us our, our three, um, which will be used when it comes to our midterms and really used throughout the semester, but more specifically um, for your midterm. So we know our first theoretical framework is African-American male theory, uh, which posits that African people are resistant and resilient with innate capacity for brilliance. Uh, we know our second theoretical framework is funds of knowledge, which articulates the knowledge that gets passed down from one generation to the next, that speaks to the culture's uniqueness and allows that culture to understand their place in the world. Um, so your last theoretical framework is from the theory, critical race theory. Um, the framework is counter storytelling. So again, the theory is from critical race theory the framework is called counter storytelling. And what counter storytelling does, it focuses on telling stories and narratives from the standpoint of the marginalized, from the standpoint of the oppressed, and I'm not focusing on stories from the dominant society. So for example, if we were to use the, stories, uh, the story of American discovery, we're not gonna tell that story from the vantage point of Columbus. We're gonna look at telling that story from the vantage point of the um, indigenous people who were here on the land when Columbus arrived. That would be the counter storytelling. Uh, if we were to use the example of the protests from two summers ago surrounding George Floyd's death, 
We're not going to tell that story from the standpoint of the business owners, of the mayors of the city, of the police. You're going to tell that story from those, from the standpoint and the vantage point of those who were protesting. You may tell that story from the vantage points of someone from George Floyd's family, um, or even from George Floyd himself would be a counter storytelling. So again, not focusing on the dominant side, on the dominant um, culture's narrative, but focusing on the marginalized culture's narrative when telling the story. Um, does that make sense? Does anyone need me to further explain or articulate this notion of the counter storytelling? Do you mind, Professor, repeating the first one again? Um, the first theoretical framework? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. The first theoretical framework is African American male theory. And it states that African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but everybody's good on counter storytelling outside of that thing. Okay, all right. Um, so, when you're dealing with James Baldwin, um, and we'll be dealing with James Baldwin next week as well, um, there's a, a framework within itself when engaging his work. Um, and I call it the Baldwinian pillars of white inferiority. And, and we know that I use white inferiority in place of white supremacy. Um, let me ask you though, what does a pillar do? What is a pillar designed to do? Hold something up. Yep, exactly. It's gonna hold something up, it's gonna support something, right? Um, so we're talking about the pillars that hold up this institution that we call white inferiority. Those two pillars are the white imagination and the maintenance of white innocence, right? So this idea of maintaining the innocence of white folks or the idea of whiteness itself. So if we're dealing with the white imagination, for me, when I think about the white imagination, Hollywood is a quintessential depiction of that imagination, right? So if you think about it, folks in Hollywood, which by and large are white men, are able to imagine things and then produce them into film, right? Um, within that, you, they are able to explore their, their fears, they're able to explore their desires, right? They can play out all the things that they so choose within their imagination. Is anyone familiar with the film Birth of a Nation? Anybody heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay. So Birth of a Nation is widely recognized as a classic piece of American film. If you take a film class, you'll probably watch this film first. And it's highly touted because of the way that it's technically shot, the camera lens that was used, the camera angles that is used. Um, the producer of this film was D.W. Griffith. Griffith. Um, this film would go on tour throughout the East Coast, actually throughout all of the United States when it first comes out. Um, and it's played in the White House for a period of months. The premise of the film is set in what's called Reconstruction, um, the Reconstruction South, right? So uh, the Civil War has just ended. Black folks are now able to vote. Black folks are now able to occupy um, positions in political offices. And they are actually doing so, right? And the way that D.W. Griffith depicts this, he shows African people in the Senate um, with their feet up on the Senate table, um, eating watermelon, eating fried chicken, these very stereotypical um, depictions of Black folks in, in power. And I, and I think it's funny how he depicts this um, Black man with his feet up on the table when you think about what happened on January 6th. And, um, when you had the folks um, storming the, 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 the Capitol, right? But while this is going on in political office, in the town that's being depicted through the film, black men are running rampant trying to rape white women, right? So much so that one of the climax of the film is a black man pursuing a white woman, and she's in such a state of fear that she throws herself off of a cliff juxtapose instead of I'm sorry just to throw herself off the cliff so she's not raped by the black man now an interesting tidbit of information about the film there are no black actors in the film everyone in the film that is portrayed as black is portrayed by a white man in black face so um once this happens 
the Ku Klux Klan comes on the scene and they are able to save the town and then birth this new nation that we now know called America in a way that um, the power dynamics of race have been reestablished, right? Um, looking at what Caesar put in the chat, yeah, they, they pick, depicted these black characters in very animalistic fashion. So you're absolutely right, Caesar. Yeah, um, um, I had an English class and I remember that you, you guys kind of bring back like memories that I think we had watched like some of it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So this is what I'm talking about when I say film depicting the white imagination. Because if you think about it logically, if you think about it by the numbers, right, the fear of black men raping white women is highly unreasonable, right? By and large, there was way more white men raping black women than there was black men raping white women. It's just, it's just it's not, it's the, the power dynamics wouldn't allow for that to be so, okay? So this white imagination. Now, the maintenance of white innocence, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Ezekiel Ford, on and on and on and on and on and on and on, right? These are all names of individuals who had their lives taken from them by the white power structure. All of those are homicides, right? No one can argue that. But what happens is the event happens. The, the person in question, the murderer, goes before a jury of his peers, right? That's particularly important because they really do get juries of their peers. And what ends up happening by and large, nine times out of 10, they walk away with what's called justifiable homicide, right? And they all use the same, I'm gonna say excuse as to why this homicide is justified. In every circumstance, every perpetrator says the same thing. What are they saying that, that allows them to get the justifiable homicide? What is the claim? Does anyone know? Is it about them thinking there was a threat to their lives? Perfect. Yep, you spot on, bro. That's exactly what it is. These ju these these homicides become justified because all of them claim that they fear for their life. Okay. Let me ask y'all a question. For those who work, when you filled out your jo that job application, did you get a description of your duties? When you yeah. Yeah, right? So you knew what you were signing up for before you started that job, right? And then they put you through a series or a time period before you actually get to do the job where you're training, correct? So you have a training period. So for the police officers, their training includes um, on weapons training, right? Tactical training, how to engage somebody in physical combat, right? They're also supplied um, bulletproof vests, handcuffs, pepper spray, batons, um, tasers, actual guns, right? So how is it logical that these individuals who sign up to do this work, who are trained to do this work, who are tactically and artillery prepared to do this work, are afraid of unarmed black men, women, and children? It doesn't make sense. But because of the, the white imagination's ability to make their thoughts pervasive within the society, the whole world can see and understand blackness as a threat, blackness as something to be feared, right? If you turn on the news, you see all kinds of stories about how black people are causing um, death and destruction throughout communities, right? And if you hear that, you believe in that, it would make sense as to why these police officers, even though they are more armed and more trained, fear for their life. But if you take a step back, right, and you detach yourself from the white imagination, you can see that this is ridiculous, right? There's no way that you should be afraid of someone who's unarmed. That's the old adage of bring a knife to a gunfight. No motherfucker with a gun is gonna be afraid of somebody with a knife. It just doesn't make sense, right? But we believe these things and we understand these things to be true because we operate under the understanding of the white imagination, right? So these are how these two pillars work to uphold this system of white inferiority. Does that make sense to you all? Does anyone need me to provide another example or provide further clarification? 
This is very important if you're going to understand what, what Baldwin's up to. So let's kind of get into how he uses these concepts within um, the book. So the book that you guys engage is called Going to Meet the Man. It's a, it's a um, collection of short stories by James Baldwin. Um, it was published in 1965. So keeping that, keep that in mind um, as far as the time that this was re released. But he's also, although this is published in 1965, he's writing about a time a little bit before then, right? And this notion of, of white innocence, let's kind of unpack that a little bit as it pertains to Jesse, right? So we know that we're dropped by Baldwin into Jesse's bedroom. We know that Jesse's restless. We know that Jesse can't sleep. Um, so because he can't sleep, his wife is with him. He's trying to get it cracking, right? But he cannot perform the function of trying to get it cracking. His mind is elsewhere, right? He's thinking about the happenings of his day. He's thinking about the civil unrest in his community. He's thinking about the protests that these black folks on, on are trying to do within the town to allow themselves to vote. He thinks about the um, this incident in the jail cell where he has to cattle prod the young man and beat the young man to get, to make him to get the black folks stop singing, right? And he gets this point where he kicks the boy in the face. But the way that James Baldwin writes this to me is very interesting. And he says, his foot leapt out. He had not known it was going to do. And it caught, and it, sorry, and caught the boy flush in the jaw. Right, so he kicked the kid in the face. But the way that it's written, his foot leapt out. He didn't know what was going to do that, right? Again, he, he's innocent. He didn't really want to do it. It just kind of happened. It was a knee-jerk reaction, right? And then um, he kind of investigates the singing because he they won't stop singing. So he's thinking about it. And he thinks, and he says, you know, they were singing to God. They were singing for mercy. And they hoped to go to heaven. And he had even sometimes felt, when looking into the eyes of some of the old women and a few of the very old men, that they were singing for the mercy of his soul too, right? So this is how he's understanding that song that keeps playing in his head initially. And it makes him reflect a little bit more. And he says, you know, he had never thought about, I'm sorry, excuse me, he had never thought much about what it mean to, meant to be a good person. He tried to be a good person, and he meant to be a good person. He, tr um, excuse me. He tried to treat everybody right. It wasn't his fault. Again, maintaining the innocence. It wasn't his fault if the niggers had taken it into their heads to fight against God and go against the rules laid down in the Bible for everyone to read. Right. So it's not that Jesse's a bad person. He's just doing his job as ordained by God to keep these individuals in their place, right? It's not his fault that they, they choose to go against the divine word of God and not stay in their place. He's innocent. And to kind of think about Otis, right? I want you guys to think about this. Because this, to me, this is where Otis gets important. On page 243 towards the bottom, Baldwin writes, he talking about Jesse, he had, grown a, grown, he had grown accustomed for the solution of such mysteries to go to Otis. He felt that Otis knew everything, but he could not ask Otis about this. Anyway, he had not seen Otis for two days. He had not seen a black face anywhere for more than two days. So essentially what's happening is Jesse's on his way to go somewhere with his parents. He's not really sure where he's going or what's going on, but he knows something in the town is different. Typically, when Jesse has questions around racial issues, he'll go to Otis to get those questions answered. So let me ask you this. If Jesse goes to Otis to get his questions around race answered, what does it say about Otis's household as it pertains to conversations that they have about race and Jesse's household as it pertains to conversations that they have about race. What do you think that ent entails? So what, I'm, <clears throat> so what I'm gathering is that uh, Jesse's household is very shut off and not open to this topic because I feel like underlying, they know that it's a sort of taboo as in 
Like, Otis is black, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, so Otis's household, they have to be aware of these, like, social constructs because if they aren't, they can just fucking die. Yep. Just, no, no one sugarcoated. So. Yeah, absolutely, Khalil. You hit the nail on the head, right? Survival. Their survival is dependent on them knowing how racial dynamics play out. So there's this um, concept or this idea in American households when um, children come a certain age, there's conversations that take place, right? And the conversations in the black household look, sound, and feel vastly different from the conversation in the white household. What they say in the white household is the conversation of the birds and the bees, right? And the black household is more centered around how to interact when you come into contact with police what to do when you encounter racial situations, right? Again, because these community of people are dependent on knowing these things for their survival is, let me put it this way, who is not familiar with the story of Emmett Till? Who has not heard of Emmett Till? Wait, can you repeat that? Yes. Who has not heard the story of Emmett Till? I haven't. Okay. Uh, can somebody in the class, Amir, are you familiar with Emmett Till? If so, can you kind of tell the class what happened with Emmett Till? No, I just had my hand raised because I didn't know who that was. Either. I bet, I bet. So Emmett Till was a, um, I believe this 14 year old um, young man from Chicago. His family migrated from the South to Chicago. So what would happen is spring break, summer break, he would go down to the South and hang out with his relatives from down South. Now, naturally, the Northern and Southern culture is vastly different, right? They both are just as racist as hell, but they perform the racism a little differently, right? And the South is very much so about Black folks being in their place, Black folks being subservient. The same is true in the North, but it doesn't look and feel that way, right? So as the story has it, um, Emmett Till from being, being from the North, hanging out down south with some of his cousins, looks a white woman in her eye, gives her like a head nod or something. And she perceived that as a threat to where he was trying to rape her. Goes and tells some white folks in the community, they snatch Emmett Till, um, beat him brutally, drag his body through the city, dump him in the ocean or in the, in the lake or something like that. Um, his body is recovered. His mother has decides to have an open casket funeral so the world can see the brutality that was done to her son, right? I would say if you were born in the 80s and before, every black person heard about Emmett Till, right? Because again, this is a lesson that was taught to maintain survival. Um, I think in our time, right, Emmett Till, I'm oh, sorry, Trayvon Martin is our version of Emmett Till. I think that's a, that's a parallel that you could draw, right? But again, these stories and these conversations, they have to be had in, how, in black households because their survival is dependent on it. So this allows for Jesse to go to Otis when he has questions about race because Otis knows more about racial dynamics because of how racism can impact him. But let's not get it fooled. Jesse's learning about race too, but he's learning about it a little bit differently, right? I'm gonna read this passage to you. Is that where they got him now? Asked Jesse's father. By this time, there were three car cars piled behind the first one, with everyone looking excited and shining. And Jesse noticed that they were carrying food. It was like a 4th of July picnic. Does anybody know the original etymology of the term picnic? No? So let me ask you this. What is happening in the story? What is Baldwin describing towards the end of the story? What, what event, what phenomenon? Where are they all going? Where is Jesse and his family and his community headed to?
what is being described when he says, he turned his head a little and saw the fields of faces. He watched his mother's face. Her eyes were very bright. Her mouth was open. She was more beautiful than he had ever seen her and more strange. He began to feel a joy he had never felt before. He watched the hanging, gleaming body, the most beautiful and terrible object he had ever seen till then. Whether it's one of his father's friends reached up in his hand, he held a knife. And Jesse wished he had been, been that man. It was a long, bright knife. And the sun seemed to catch it, to play with it, to caress it. It was brighter than fire. And a wave of laughter swept through the crowd. Jesse felt his father's hands on his ankles slip and tighten. The man with the knife walked toward the cloud, smiling slightly, as though this were a signal of, as a signal. Silence fell. He heard his mother cough. The man with the knife walked up to the hanging body. He turned and smiled again. Now that there was a silence fell over the crowd. The hanging head looked up. It seemed fully conscious now, as though, as though the fire had burned out terror and pain. What is Baldwin describing towards the end of the story? A hanging, right? Yeah, what's the other word for that, Khalil? Lynching. A lynching, thank you. So what's being described in this story is a lynching. So take it back to my previous question. The etymology of picnic is to pick a nigger and hang him. That's literally what that term meant before we turned it into something that you go and you have lunch, what have you, right? And so we know that um, in the story, Jesse is watching all of this play out and he has this question that he says at least three times. What did he do? What did he do? What did he do? What did a man do to deserve this type of treatment, right? Because his father, his mother, his parents' friends, they can't just be so inhumane so beastly, so heartless that they would just do this for no reason. He had to do something, right? Embedded in this question is the maintenance of white innocence, right? Because the man who's being lynched had to do something wrong. And if we read closely, we know that the man who's being lynched knocked down an old lady, right? Let me ask you, does knocking down an old lady justify being hanged, being burnt, being castrated, and being disbodied? Does that justify one another? No. Nah. No, nah, of course not. Chances are he probably did that shit on accident, right? If you think about the climate, if you think about the time, there's no way in hell a black man is going to knock over an old lady just because, right? That's just not going to make sense. But again, they have to justify to maintain their innocence. Um, and then I kind of read that passage where, you know, at the time, and Jesse's watching all this, his mother looked as beautiful as she ever has. He never felt more love for his father than in that moment, right? And, you know, her father tells him, well, I told you, said his father, you wasn't never going to forget this picnic. His face was full of sweat. His eyes were very peaceful. At that moment, Jesse loved his father more than he had ever loved him. He felt that his father had carried him through a mighty test and had revealed to him, one second, and had revealed to him a great secret, which would be the key to his life forever, right? So he's also getting trained in an understanding on race relations, right? In fact, he says that this is a secret that which would be the key to his life forever, okay? And then he closes out the scene of the lynching with this. Whatever the father had left, no, excuse me, whatever the fire had left undone, the hands and the knives and the stones of the people had accomplished. The head was carved in, one eye was torn out, one ear was hanging, but one had to look carefully to realize this, for it was now merely a black charred object on the black charred ground. Now this has a historical specificity to it, right? Because what would happen at these picnics, 
at these entertainment events, at these social gatherings. Once the body was lynched, once the body was burnt up, the crowds would come and get souvenirs. Some would get fingers, some would get toes, some would get hands, some would get arms, some would get the genitals, some would get the ears, some would get the lips. They would take pictures of these social events and mail them out as postcards, right? In fact, there's studies that show that when homes were being sold in the South and they had to go through these basements to kind of clear the home out, homes out, they would find these body parts, these souvenirs. They would find these old postcards, right? So this kind of speaks to the mentality of the individuals who were engaged in this activity that we call lynching or a picnic, right? So we know that the story starts off with Jesse unable to perform sexual activity with his wife because of the happenings of the town, right? And as he lays there and he starts to reflect, that song continues to play in, in his mind. And Jesse questions, why do I know this song? He also realizes that the way that the black folks in town is singing it is a little bit different from the way that he remembers it. I went to the river at Jordan. The water came to my knees. Where did I hear that from? Why do I know this? I went to the river at Jordan. The water came to my waist. Why is this familiar? I went to the river at Jordan. The water came over my head and then it clicks. And that makes him remember his father taking him to his first lynching, right? And we know as the story um, plays out towards the end, once he recalls this moment, once he recalls this key to his life forever, he feels excited again. And then he's able to perform his sexual duties, right? So what Baldwin is doing with that, even though it's crude, even though it can be understood as perverse, right? He's being attentive and he's pointing us as readers to the relation between sexual desire and power. And he says they work hand in hand. Because when Jesse felt that his community was out of power, he wasn't able to perform sexually. It took him remembering a time where that power dynamic was established for him to feel comfortable enough to perform his sexual duty. So I'm going to leave um, leave it at that. We'll spend the rest of the time for our fishbowl and course conversation. Um, if you've went twice already, you're good. If you have not, you need to at least go twice. Um, you could talk about your journal. You could talk about my notes, or you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout room. Um, does anyone want to volunteer? Uh, can I say something? Yeah, for your fishbowl, Nick, or you uh, just want to send in general for the fishbowl? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Let me. I'm gonna write you down, and you can start us off. Okay, give me one second. All right. Uh, uh, something cool. I thought was really interesting. Oh, sorry, what? Let me just get the rest of the fishbowl and we'll let you go. Okay, Nick, give me one second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You good? Can I go to you, please? Um, Khalil, that was you? Yes. And uh, may I go after Khalil? Yep, yeah, perfect. So we got uh, Nick, Khalil, and Maxwell. Anyone else want to volunteer? We could get one more. All right. So um, I'll Nick, go to oh, no, no. Zachary. Go ahead. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. It's all good. I really like this reading. Cool. So we'll have you four go. Um, Nick, you can start it off, man. Uh, something that I liked that you said was that how a lot of it depends on, or it's all about perspective, how um, how we should instead like think of it as uh, white inferiority instead of uh, white supremacy and how the way that we think ha holds a lot of power and how the, I understand how the creation of race, how, or I think I understand how it's like connected in everything now since if we're told about it, we're gonna like think about it subconsciously a lot. And I think that has a lot to do with it that we should like really look into ourselves and just like looking into ourselves because they help out a lot. So Interpersonal reflection, Nick, that's a very good point. Thank you, man. Who, who's next? Oh, me. Okay. Um, uh, talk, like on the topic of like subjectiveness, I like in my notes, I wrote down like when you were talking about uh, subjective niceness, and especially in terms of how like Jesse was perceiving it, because he hits he has a moment of self-reflection where he's like, I thought I had been like treating everybody right. And that's very interesting to think about uh, for me personally, because 
Um, one, it helps me like self reflect when I see somebody do like something I think is like fucked up or like weird or something. I just need to understand in my own mind that it's like to them this may be normal. And I need to understand like why it may be normal to them, and then I can start to like actually go about like handling the situation or anything or something like that. So that's what I found really interesting. That's what I gathered from this reading. Um, Khalil, I'm gonna come back to that because you make you bring up a really good point. Who's next? Uh, so I thought it was uh, interesting. So like you know when um, Jesse as a kid he had his friend Otis. Um, I feel like before he that's when he like before he saw the racial divide that society has created, you know. And then later on when like his dad brings him to the lynching, his first lynching. Uh, that's when like he he gets like put on the side of like you know what I mean, Wh which isn't right. But then he thought it was right, and he thought like it was gaining a sense of power. You know what I mean? Yeah. I thought that was crazy to think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, I'll go. Um, one of the thoughts I had was when we were talking about how um, uh, Jesse's father was talking about how like he wouldn't forget this picnic and how like Jesse feels more love for his father and like the mother was like like beautiful. Like I was just like, that was just so weird to me and I couldn't understand like like what it is like why why does this like why does he feel this way and if it's something like <clears throat> like connected or like deeply rooted in our nature like like what is it like is it just uh is it like just within us or is it like just the environment like what does your environment affect you like the time you're born in like how much does that affect you or is it just something like in our nature mm -hmm. and i just like it made me question like you know like will racism like ever end or is just just something part of like human nature that will never change um excuse me I'm, I'm really like tripping off of the theme that you guys have brought up in the fishbowl um yeah, because it's, it's really it's some really profound shit y'all talking about. And then for me, I'm thinking about what you'll read next week, because a lot of what you guys are kind of teetering around here within the fishbowl is directly the problem that Baldwin is taking up in the reading for next week, right? So this idea that Khalil brings up of, um, actually Khalil and Nick, this notion of self-reflection um, and being able to like, look at someone's circumstances although that you may not understand their action and, and knowing that there's something deeper at play with behind those actions and this is a lot of the work that baldwin does right um and, and it makes me think about the way that baldwin understands the notion of love and this is important also so when and when you read next week you're going to be like yo this guy baldwin loves white folks like he has just but that's really not what he's talking about not in this like romantic type of holding hands walking through the park uh, making mixed babies type of love that's not what baldwin's interested in the type of ba love that baldwin seeks to interact white folks with is a love that is unabashedly honest right it's a love that shows them all their shortcomings it a love is a love that shows them who they are and not the legend of who they think they are. It's a love that straps strips away their desire to maintain their innocence. When you read Baldwin's novels, so what we're reading are like essays and stories, but when you read his no novels like um, um, in another country, uh, Giovanni's Room, he does this thing with mirror, with mirrors, with windows, and with water because all three of those things can reflect your image back to you, right? And if you think about what a mirror does, it's gonna show you who you are and show you what you look like. Like you can have in your mind, your outfit, how you think it's gonna look, but before you leave the house, you're gonna check that mirror to make sure that how you think you look is how you really look, right? And Baldwin says, this is the work that love should do. It should show yourself to yourself in the purest form all your shortcomings, all your nastiness, right? He also says a famous quote of Baldwin, if I love you, I must make you aware of the things that you are unconscious of, right? And again, or the things that you seek to put to the back of your mind because they make you feel uncomfortable about yourself. 
this self-reflection that Khalil is talking about for Baldwin is the reason why, looking at the chat, we will never get around this thing of racism because those who are in power in this racial dynamic refuse to self-reflect. I don't want to hear about critical race theory because it reminds me of all the fucked up shit I did. So we're going to ban that from school. That's a refusal to self-reflect. And then Zachary asked the question, kind of weird how Jesse never loved his father more than he loved him at that moment. It's weird that his mom's never looked as beautiful as she did in that moment. And we're looking at this from the vantage point of 2021 where that shit just sounds beyond reason. But conte historical contextuality is important, right? This, for them, for Jesse and his community, right? This is no different than going to watch a Dodger game. And think about, for those who are into sports, the first time your parents took you to go see a sporting event, right? The connection and the love that you felt for them after going to experience that event. They would equate that as the same. The person who being burned is inconsequential, right? So as bizarre as this shit may sound, and I agree with you, Zachary, but to do the work that Nick is talking about, you can understand that the reason why he felt that way about his parents, for them, it was no different than going to watch the Dodgers play, going to see the Lakers, going to a Raider game, right? And this is what we're dealing with. And this is what Baldwin's trying to point us to when we're talking about moving beyond racism you got to deal with all this. You got to deal with the tradition of racism that gets passed down from generation to generation to generation, right? Jesse says this is a key to his life forever. So how do you unpack someone who feel, how do you unpack something or a system that someone feels that allows them to navigate through their life, right? What Baldwin is doing is writing white folklore. This is what this is. It's white folklore, because these are the, in a certain time, right? The things that they sought to pass down from generation to generation to generation. Power. Um, let's just get like two more comments. Um, I don't want to put women on the spot, but I, I'm going to put women on the spot just because we haven't heard from y'all today. Um, so let's get two comments from two women and, and we'll call it a day. And it could be about anything. Um, I was going to comment on um, also the fact people use this all the time, but racism is not innate. You're not born with that discrimination in your heart. So it's taught. And for it to be something so emotionally connected for this person in like their life and it being passed down through their culture and their family, it just shows how they just, they kept up the, the tradition. It was something that they wanted to do and they wanted to teach it and they didn't want it to die. Yeah. So they just kept it up. Yeah. And, and the justifications allows for it to maintain and not be viewed as something negative. Just so y'all know, right? The most recent lynching was 2020. So it hasn't gone too far. Um, one more comment. preferably a sister. I wanted to add on with to, um, what Heather said about how like um, you learn like racism and stuff. In psychology, we learn about like how you pick up fear from like your parents or an adult role model. So even if like subconsciously your parents have, you have seen your parents act differently to a certain race or a certain group of people, or you see them react a certain way, even if they don't mean to intentionally put like um, racism into your Heart or hatred into your heart, you start picking that up since you're a little kid. And I'm gonna um, further complicate that, Bridget. There's a, um, when I did my, when I was doing my coursework for my PhD program, I did a, I had an education and race course. And the first book that we had to read is titled The First R. And what the book was, was two, a sociologist and an educator 
who did a case study of a, a preschool, a kindergarten, a first grade, and second grade. And they stayed within these um, classrooms for two years. And what they were studying was how these children, as young as four, five, six, and seven, perform race or racism. And every time, without fail, there was a racial incident, the parents would be brought in, the parents would say, well, they didn't learn this in our house. They must have learned it at the school. The school says, well, they didn't learn this at the school because we don't promote racism. The parents would be like, well, we don't either, right? And what the author argues, what's happening is these children are learning these behaviors from not the parents by and large, right, but from society. If you're in an anti-Black society, there's going to be anti-Black cartoons. There are going to be anti-Black images and video games, right? So these children are picking them these things up subconsciously because society promotes these things. And what happens is in the white households, white parents think by not having these conversations, we're not contributing to racism. But what they're not doing is create is having the conversation to create anti-racist or having anti-racist conversations, right? So if you're not having any counter to a force that is normative in society, all you're going to do is perpetuate what's normative in that society. So what they argue is not necessarily a learned behavior, but it's a socialization because we're in a racist society. So for